Welcome, and thank you for joining me for today's exploration of the greatest American Old World Tartarian homes, or houses, structures that people resided in. When we do these explorations, though, we see that these structures tend to look like amazing castles, such as this one, Beacon Towers, in Sands Point, New York. Built in the Shadow West style, but I'm going to call this the Gargamel Revival style. And I'm calling it the Gargamel Revival style because it seems as though we can just assign any name to these architectural styles. This was built in 1917 and 1918, one year, and they tore it down in 1945. Looking closer, we see the typical details of a castle structure, and it was built as a residence for Alva Belmont. She was the former spouse of William Vanderbilt, so those names you probably recognize. Very beautiful and amazing structure with many chimneys in this fairy tale tower. I even like the elongated windows on top of the tower. Why exactly does one need such a pretty tower? With the wonderful weather vanes, as we'll be told that they are on top of it. You've got to attract lightning. It couldn't possibly have another function. What is with all these chimneys and all these fireplaces? And you see the little balcony. And look at how long those windows are on the ground floor. Very incredible. And parapets. Perhaps Alva, who was the owner of the house, wanted to reenact a scene from the movie Deathstalker 3 when Deathstalker fought Trucks Artist. And now looking in the interior, and we see one of these beautiful fireplaces. Just an incredible structure, and we have to wonder how they built this in a year. Look at all the detail on the ceiling. And regardless of how the place is decorated, we can see that there was some real effort that went into the interior. Interesting note about Alva Belmont is she was a suffragist, and she lived in castles her entire life. She was born in a castle in Mobile, Alabama. You can see it yourself, or mobile, I should say. Very, very pretty structure, and imagine having something like this to live in. We don't know why it was torn down in 1945. Moving on to the Bradbury Mansion, this is in Los Angeles, California, built in 1886 and demolished again for reasons unknown in 1929. Perhaps it had something to do with the start of the Great Depression, or maybe it was just unsafe, or passersby found that this house was very ugly. This does seem a little more house-like as opposed to castle-like, so we won't assign it the Gargamel Revival style sobriquet. Look at that amazing porch. Ima imagine having a porch like that with that kind of intricate detail as you go out into the front to take a look. And of course we have steps leading up to the door. Then the balcony with the oval window on the second, maybe third floor if we count the basement. Though I always thought every house in California didn't have a basement. And again, we see many chimneys, beautiful towers, and ornate detail. Why do all these houses have to have ornate detail? Moving on to the C.M. Forbes home. This is in Portland, Oregon, built around 1887. We don't have an exact date. And demolished again in 1929. And more house-like, yet you see the pretty towers. You see all the ornate detail that goes up on the roof. And you have to wonder, how easy would this have been to actually build, especially in 1887? What was really the function of all this ornate detail? Was everyone just so ostentatious at that time? Anyone with money that they could afford to have this done? And then, of course, we had all these traveling workers that many people have theorized are all over the place. Now we go to New York, New York, and we look at the Charles M. Schwab House, built from 1902 to 1906, and then demolished in 1948. We're going to come back and take another look at this building later in the presentation, because it does bear a bit of a benchmark to compare the other houses to. Yes, calling this a house is one of life's great ironies. I think I'll call this Camelot Revival Style. Very, very beautiful, and interestingly enough, built in an area of New York City where there were not intended to be houses. And if you look up the history of this particular building, you'll see the structure that's standing there now. Looking at the interior where we have these two very pretty staircases that meet, it really gives you the impression that there was a lot more going on with this building. And we have to wonder, questioning the historical narrative as we do, if this building was already there, what was its original intention and function? And we have to consider that with all these so-called houses or homes. Did they have a different intention or function when they were originally built? 
because we just see all this beautiful intricate detail on the inside and you look at the entryway look at this with the ceiling and what exactly does that symbol in the middle there mean and we see the cherub angels and how could anyone why would anyone even if you had this kind of wealth want to put this sort of effort into showing this what was really the purpose behind this now of course we know it's for the artistic inspiration to show what the true capabilities of humanity were and now we go to Newport, Rhode Island, looking at the Chetwode Mansion, built in 1903 and destroyed by a fire in 1973. This may seem a little bit more modest compared to the other homes that we've looked at so far. However, you still see the rotunda with the columns under it, and you can tell that there's a little bit more to this house than meets the eye. Looking a little bit more house-like, although we could say it has the... Uh, Roman Greco revival style, which might be more appropriate here, although I think we're given that name, so anytime we see a column or a pillar, we're going to think Greco Roman. And now we go to the second cliff house in San Francisco, California. One of the most incredible structures, given the fact that it's literally dangling over a cliff. This was the second one. Built in 1886, and it survived the very famous San Francisco earthquake in 1906, or General Funston's troops didn't get over there to set it on fire. Perhaps they were a little busy dealing with other things. And ironically, it was destroyed by a fire in 1907. So this very beautiful and very otherworldly house was only in existence for 11 years, according to the official narrative. This has come up in many explorations just because it's not only the structure, it's the location of the structure, which just defies simple explanation. Why would anyone want to build a house in this location? We have to wonder what's the real story behind it. What was this building originally? What function did it serve? And how was it constructed in such a pernicious location? And anyone who's been to San Francisco, you're well aware of the winds, and there's the fire that finally destroyed it in 1907. Looks like we just have a party of gawkers. Oh, look, the house is on fire. I better get a picture. And don't you find it intriguing that someone just happened to be standing by in 1907 to get a picture of this house on fire? I'm sure it was all just coincidence and everyone was in place at the right time. What a tragedy, though. Such a beautiful structure, it survived the earthquake, and it survived all the actions taken after the earthquake, and yet it was still destroyed by a fire, barely a year later. Truly a pity, and a great loss. Again, I wonder, what was the function of this building originally? I mean, could it have been that these incredible structures were used for residences, perhaps? Yet we look on the inside, and it's difficult to find interior photos as this building was only around for 11 years, and we see the same ornate detail. And we have to wonder what exactly was going on if this group of people that were in this photo had found the structure and they inhabited it. What did they think of it? And did they really have any thoughts at all, or were they just there to party and enjoy while they could? And it's almost as though they knew they only had a limited duration of time before this structure would be moved on, or as it were, reduced to ashes. Now we go to the El Marisol in Palm Beach, Florida. This was built in 1920, demolished in 1959. Interestingly enough, on the official historical accounts, there are numerous questions asking why this was demolished in 1959. And there doesn't seem to be a simple answer. And of course, we'll be told that this is some sort of Spanish or colonial revival style. Although, maybe I think something more appropriate might be Palm Beach revival style, since whenever you see a structure like this, you've got lots of palms around it. Now we go back to Chicago, or Shilaga, and this is the George Pullman Mansion, built in 1876 and demolished in 1922. The finest technology of 1876, and right after the Chicago fire, no less. And they managed to build an incredible residence like this, or so we're told. You know, we have so many different names for these buildings, structures, homes, houses, mansions, palaces, castles. All are appropriate. The intriguing thing about the George Pullman Mansion, though, is the fact that it's such an intricate and elaborate building, and yet it wasn't with us very long. We didn't even get 50 years out of it. 
<laughs> looking at the interior, you really have to ask that question. And on the interior, you see the small columns and pillars. You see the very beautiful, well-decorated ceiling, the floors. Imagine what it would have been like to live in such a structure. And as we go through on this exploration, I'd like you to think which structure would you want to live in or what would be your favorite? And let me know in the comments because we see such amazing diversity and different styles. And we're told that's what people were trying at that time. And now we go to the La Ronda in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, built in 1929 and demolished in 2009. Now, this was one that survived a lot longer, yet somehow it was still demolished, despite the preservation efforts of many people in Pennsylvania. Very beautiful structure, and we see the parapets again, in case someone wants to reenact the final duel scene from the famous movie Death Stalker 3. And look at the windows and the detail. Again, another clashing architectural style. The other interesting thing is when you consider the logistics behind all these clashing architectural styles for many of these structures that were built within the same 30-40 year period. Here's the interior of the La Ronda, and this is incredible. Here you really get the feeling of a castle hall. And yet with the arches on the ceiling, it kind of reminds me of many cathedrals that we see across the lands. Very beautiful, and we have to wonder, what else did we miss from the loss of this building? Now we go back to San Francisco, where we're going to look at the Mark Hampton, or excuse me, the Mark Hopkins Mansion. This was built in 1875, and this did burn in the 1906 earthquake. So General Funston's troops perhaps got over to this one, and they had to burn it down to create a fire break. Look at the beauty in this structure, built in 1875. And I'll zoom in on a trolley, because in the 21st century, trolleys are very San Francisco, but in the early 20th century, late 19th century, trolleys were found in every small town in the Midwest United States, and probably every single town and city across the lands, it's hard to say. But I always find it interesting how we think of trolleys as associated with San Francisco now. Back to the mansion itself. Look at this right here, the detail in what looks to be a dome structure almost, as part of a house. Built in 1875, or so we're told. We see elaborate windows, and you know, I, I'm struggling to even come up with some sort of architectural name for a mansion or castle or palace like this. Perhaps you could help me out in the comments. And of course, we see the usual trappings of the fairy tale tower, so maybe we should call this a fairy tale revival style, because this just seems very otherworldly, as though this is from a fantasy novel. Look at the roof on this and the sloping nature of the roof, and here another tower with the windows on it. It's as though detail would create more detail, and just because you had a detailed tower, you had to add even more detail to it, such as we see with the many subsidiary towers that seem to hang off the main towers. And this is definitely not an architectural style you'll see today. Of course, you might have someone who will tell you, this isn't very complicated. Of course, the real question is not whether it's complicated, but is it difficult? Here's the interior of the Mark Hopkins mansion. And don't you find the detail in this very interesting? It almost gives a science fiction feeling to it. And I'm reminded how in the movie Blade Runner, director Ridley Scott used several old world buildings to great effect. This almost looks like this could be a set from the movie Blade Runner. Very beautiful arches and wonderful decoration and again we're not even talking about how the structure is furnished and now we go to Topeka Kansas this is the old governor's mansion this was built in 1887 and demolished in 1965 no doubt with the urban renewal phase that sweep the United States or so we're told and while this may seem a little bit more modest we do see the elaborate detail here in a structure in the middle of Kansas and also keep in mind that while this was built, they were working very diligently to complete the State House in Topeka, Kansas, which was architected by our favorite E. Townsend Mix from Milwaukee fame. Now we go to the Palmer Mansion in Chicago, Illinois. A very beautiful mansion, and watchers of this channel have seen the structure before. This was built in 1885 and demolished in 1950. And really, you get a castle vibe with this. This is definitely Camelot revival style. Look at this entryway with these little pillars and columns. And this goes back to the whole concept of scaling with all of these structural aspects that we see and not just these houses, homes, castles, palaces, but also in the many government buildings and municipal buildings that we see. 
And here you have your tower with your parapets again, because apparently the wealthy like to reenact famous duels, and therefore they needed such things. I like the windows in the tower, too. And look at the styling that you have with the different colored bricks. Also look at the small uh, windows or arches that run off on the main tower. And yet another little subsidiary tower on the main tower. Again, as though there was no limitation on what detail they could add to these buildings. Imagine just being able to go out and say that you could design a home like this. Now, of course, we're told that these were very wealthy people. They had no limits, such as the aforementioned Alva Belmont. You look at all the houses she lived in. You look at her summer home, and she had an incredible summer home that looked like it was basically a small version of uh, the White House. Look at this when you look at where the windows are placed and of course we see the very large foundation stones that are a hallmark of these older structures it just defies the imagination what we see in these incredible buildings and here's the interior of the Palmer Mansion and look at this this just defies simple explanation and this goes back to seeing another film Blade Runner, that perhaps they could have filmed scenes in this had this building survived beyond 1950 to the 1980s. This almost looks like this could have been the meeting room where Deckard met with Tyrell and they talked about the replicants. This could have been a very easy stand-in for Tyrell's house. And this was built in 1885. And yet to me, in 2023, this has a lot of futuristic and imagination to it. Now let's go back to the Charles M. Schwab house after looking at some more houses. And again, this is our quintessential castle, our Camelot revival style, as I'm calling it. What I find fascinating is that this was built in only four years, 1902 to 1906. So consider that. And you can look up plenty of mansions that are currently under construction all across the lands. And I want to ask you how many of them are only done in four years? Now, looking closer, we see the elaborate detail with the entryway. You know, you have to have towers on your entryway, as if, you know, other towers aren't enough. The interesting thing about Charles M. Schwab is that supposedly he died nearly penniless because he was a risk-taker when it came to his finances, and when the market crash hit in 1929, he didn't come off so well. The tragedy is he had offered this incredible edifice as a residence for the mayor in New York City. But the reform-minded mayor, we're told by the official narrative, LaGuardia, did not find this house meeting his standards. Now, for what reason that was, and was he trying to appeal to the people as being someone common? I don't know. But as a result of that decision, this amazing structure, house, castle, mansion, whatever you want to call it, was demolished, unfortunately, in 1948. And we only have these images to appreciate it. We see the many details on every single window and the many different fireplaces that always seem to be present on these buildings. As though they were struggling to keep them warm, but we have to wonder if they had a different function. And here's another interior view of the Charles M. Schwab house. And just look at the detail in the sitting room. You see it on the ceiling, on the walls. In four years, no matter how much money you had, how were they able to do all of this in four years? And I'm sure people in the comments might have some ideas that it's not that complicated. It can be done if you just have enough money and no limitations. Still, I'm in awe of the detail that you see here. And you talk to people who are into finishing and they'll tell you it's not exactly an easy matter no matter how much time you have. Now we go to White Marsh Hall in Windmore, Pennsylvania. Or excuse me, Windmore, Pennsylvania. This was built in 1921 and demolished in 1980. So this one lasted a little bit longer. And here we see the classic stylings of what will be told our Roman Greco revival or American democracy revival in the 19th century with the typical columns and the triangular construction. Here's an interior photo and here you actually have columns on the inside with this elaborate staircase. Again, this is another building I'd love to see construction photos, especially of the foundation and the interior, which always seem to be lacking. If anybody has anything, or if they have more information on any of these structures, please share in the comments. I would certainly like to look in more detail on each of these. This is an overview to see if there is interest in further more detailed explorations of these various structures, homes or houses. Don't you find it amazing that these were homes or houses? 
And now we go to the William A. Clark House in New York, New York. And this was built in 1897 to 1911. So they do tell us that this beauty took 14 years to build. Unfortunately, it was demolished in 1927. So 14 years to build, and it was only around for 16 years. And we have to wonder what the story on this one was. And look at the beautiful tower. And there's more detail that seems to have gone into this one than some of the others. And what kind of style would you call this? Mm, American science fiction revival? I have no idea. I'm open in the comments. But you just look at all the arches that go into the tower itself, along with the many chimneys. And again, it seems like we're looking at something from another world, another time. It's very difficult to pinpoint exactly what they were going for in this kind of detail. And we're told it's clashing architectural styles and, you know, there were no logistical considerations in this group of traveling workers that were going all around the nation that the mainstream narrative will tell us. Apparently they could build all of these clashing styles, whether it was Romanesque revival, Chateauesque or whatever, or Gargamel revival style. I'm going to see if there's another one that's Gargamel revival style. Look at that with the the detail on the windows and looking closer to the ground and then you see that ground window over there where you have the little arch with the different stones and here's an interior of the William A. Clark house and now we're almost expecting it beautiful ornate detail on the ceiling and the walls and a very well adorned fireplace because what else would you have it still blows my mind that all the effort that went into building this and it was only around for 16 years no one wanted to preserve this. No one could think of another function or use for this incredible building. Nope, tear it down. We need our block apartment housing that's at a very cost-effective rate for our residents of New York. And now, I just want to show you, going back to the Paris Bel Air Mansion. This cost $75 million, and this is modern day. This is what $75 million will get you now. Now, after all these structures that we just looked at, how much does this mansion really stand out to you? Let's look at the interior. So, the story that we seem to be getting doing this comparison is that even if you are wealthy now, you really can't get anything that compares to what was in the past. This just seems so very modest. $75 million. That's what this will get you now. Does this compare to all these structures that we just looked at? Is this the story that we're willing to believe? Because we always say it's a matter of money. Well, how much money did the Hiltons need to spend to get a house like we just saw? What's the greatest old world house of America? Well, by virtue of it being the only survivor, the Biltmore Estate, or the Biltmore House or Mansion in Asheville, North Carolina. You can still go visit this beauty today, and it's considered a tourist attraction and yet another amazing wedding venue in Asheville, North Carolina. Built for George Washington Vanderbilt II between 1889 and 1895, only six years to build this beauty, and they say it's one of the prominent examples of Gilded Age mansions. I don't know what you would call this, what actual style would fit. Now they say it's shadow-esque, the same as the first structure we looked at, Beacon Towers. However, I think there needs to be a special name for this. Perhaps they should call this Imperial Revival Style, or imperial citadel revival style of course we do have construction photos with this one although we have the usual slew of questions that come up with this incredible house where we have individuals just standing around and we have very level construction you can see some of the archways and you have to wonder on this one you can see the example with some of the bricks why is it the bricks towards the foundation look like they're already old I don't know. I mean, maybe these construction photos are good enough, and maybe they prove that this was really constructed, as they said, towards the end of the 19th century. But I wonder. I wonder about the Biltmore Estate. And maybe not the best interior photo here, but I just wanted to give you the idea that you see the same details. The same details with the ceiling, the fireplace, and just the gorgeous arrangement of everything within this incredible house itself. I've had the pleasure of visiting this estate a couple times, and here's an overarching view of the dining room, and look at that fireplace with that kind of detail. And also look at the ceiling. I don't know. It's very difficult for me to believe that this was built as we're told. There's a lot of detail to the Biltmore, and I wanted to introduce it in this video as the example of the best of our old world houses that we took a look at because it still survives to this day. 
I'd also like to see in the comments if there's interest in doing an exploration video focused on just the Biltmore. I've gotten a couple requests for it, but I want to see what your feelings are. Here's the ballroom. You know, a very modest ballroom at the Biltmore. And you look at the floor and the detail and the ceiling and the arches. And here's another construction photo. Now, I pulled this one out because apparently in mid-construction, George Vanderbilt took a group of guests to tour the area during construction in 1893. Why exactly would he do this? I mean, we know that George Vanderbilt had many structures, many mansions, many houses, many castles all across the nation. Was it just that neat to go see a construction site that he would delay construction just to take a little group to tour it? Very interesting story. And again, we have the same questions about this construction photo. Well, as always, ask questions, explore yourself, and you'll restore the world. Thank you for joining me for today's exploration. And again, in the comments, let me know which one was your favorite. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Welcome to the Rest Through Orbis channel and thank you for joining me today. We're going to be exploring Gilded Age Wonders. When you walk about, whether you're in North America, Europe, or wherever you are in the lands, and you see wondrous and very well ornately decorated mansions, you wonder on the origin of them. And most of the time, it's quite a very simple story. There is someone who had a lot of wealth and a lot of capital at their disposal. They hired an architect and an amazing structure was built. And we'll start by examining Linden Towers, built 1873, Gothic Italian 8 Second Empire, and it was unfortunately demolished in the 1930s. Now, one of the recurring trends that we'll get is, what exactly is the Gilded Age? Well, the Gilded Age describes a time from 1870 to 1890, primarily in the United States, when there was a lot of real wage growth as a result of industrial expansion and the growth of the railroad. Real wage growth, apparently, as opposed to phony wage growth. And it resulted in many people becoming very wealthy and having disposable income to build wondrous places such as these Linden Towers in California, San Francisco to be precise, or in the San Francisco area, Menlo Park. And this was built by James C. Flood, and he was one of those uh, well-to-do entrepreneurs who managed to make a name for himself and earn a lot of capital in the 19th century. So he hired a Canadian architect, and they built this uh, very incredible structure. And, of course, as we know, all you need is an architect, a lack of safety standards, a nice industrialization period, and artisans running all over the country. We're actually told that this wondrous edifice is one of the finest examples of artisan work in all of California. Or rather, at least it was until it was untimely demolished. Now, why was it untimely demolished? Well, we're told that when Mr. Flood had this built, he also had another mansion in San Francisco that was his primary mansion. And this particular tower or mansion or castle or whatever you want to call it was extraneous for his uses. Very lovely fountain out there in front of the house. And I have to say the tower is very unique in and of itself. We have to have a very fine and pointy tower so we know that we're in a wonderful structure. And considering the grounds itself, you know, you get the idea that you're in California, beyond any shadow of a doubt. And some of these images do have the issues with the sky, but we can simply attribute that to limitations of the photography technology at the time. And yet, in every view of this house, we can see that this is made of either stone or some fine structure. Here's the gate that still endures to this day. So considering the story of Mr. Flood, though, after he made his riches in the silver mines, and we're really not going to spend much time because all the stories of these houses that we have, these castles, these mansions, tend to be the same. Somebody struck it rich in some particular area, they hired an architect, and voila. This is another building that's actually on the same grounds as the Linden Tower, and you can see that the subsidiary buildings were just as well built as the main structure. Look at that, you got a little pediment there and some very finely detailed windows, and why not have a dome with a little cupola on it? And apparently this was just a supporting building on the grounds as part of the garden. Very nice. Amazing what you could do with wealth. Here's a picture of uh, Mr. Flood himself, and you'll see it's not an actual photograph, but that doesn't disprove anything. It is a very well-rendered drawing, and I'm sure if we did a little bit more research, we could actually find a photograph. I'm certainly not doubting the existence of Mr. Flood, especially given his 
wonderful influence that he had at the time in his silver mine. Here's the James C. Flood mansion that's in San Francisco, and we're going to have to do an exploration of San Francisco, but apparently this was the primary residence. So, unfortunately, the Linden Towers was not his primary residence. And when Mr. Flood passed away later in the 19th century, he left the entire estate to his daughter, and she had no use to it, and just decided to let it go. Here's the interior of the Linden Towers, and once again we can see that it is very well decorated on the inside, again, for an extraneous location, an extraneous house. And I always find it interesting that they say people need to have three or four houses, and of course that is attributable to what we have with modern day wealth, and, and of course you want to have houses in many different locations. But you'd like to think if you were going to put this kind of effort and this kind of capital into a location, you'd at least spend some time there. I know, I know, the whole concept of going beyond the basics of necessity is the whole intention behind being wealthy. It's why it's the quote-unquote American dream, at least until you come across the comedian in the film Watchmen, or the original comic. I'm very impressed, though, by a lot of the woodwork that we see and even the layout, and once again, this is something else that you see from floors to walls to ceiling, beautiful chandelier, it's very decorated, and you can see why someone could really relax and enjoy themselves in this particular structure. Now just think if this edifice still existed today, and look at this, with the little dome and the light work coming in there. We wonder what use it would have. Would this be a museum? Would this be something that was dedicated to the state? Or would this be a bed and breakfast? Those are usually the uses that we see for any of our old world structures that survive to this day, or in this case, a Gilded Age mansion. But we can see that even the sitting room here is very well decorated and ornately detailed. And once again, quite an amazing story that this was all for a mansion that was considered extraneous. Mr. Flood had everything that he needed to live in in San Francisco itself. They did not need these linen towers. And unfortunately, it was torn down. And personally, I think that's very unfortunate that such a wonderful and lovely house, castle, mansion, whatever you want to call it, was torn down. Because the images that we have show that this is really a palace. And wouldn't it have been incredible if it could have survived and been used even as a museum? At least we'd have something we could interface with today. And that's one of the things that I enjoy with being boots on the ground with explorations, is that you can actually go into these edifices, you can examine them outside, inside, get an idea for what they feel like, really experience them. And it amazes me how many people want to detract you from experiencing things. Well, there's all these scientific scales out there that will tell you that you don't need to do that. You can just look at it on a screen, sure. This is the Drome House, 1877 Second Empire, and it was destroyed in 1935. This is in Detroit. So once again, we return to Detroit, and the reason I highlight this one is this gives you the impression of a house that's actually in a neighborhood. So we'd expect these very wealthy individuals to want to build on lavish, isolated estates that are far away from the city. But yet, here we have an example of a structure that's actually in Detroit, and it seems to be in the midst of many other structures that are very well designed and built. So, oddly enough, it gives us a different impression if we're just looking at the images, because we often think that people with wealth from the Gilded Age wanted to build on their estates in the middle of nowhere. And yet here in this image, we can see that there were many wonderful houses all built in a row. And indeed, at the end of this exploration, we're going to look at a particular community that was all about building houses like these that were all next to each other. It kind of flies in the face of what we'd expect to see, though, because if people have this kind of wealth, and certainly you can say it's disposable, why would they build a structure that's next to another structure? You'd think they'd want to be more isolated. Certainly they could afford the land, if that's what it all boiled down to. And here we have the classic image of the house, and it looks to be like a little bit of a drawing, and yet despite the fact that it seems narrow, the design and the detail that goes into it is very impressive regardless. And what's the story behind the tower? This is apparently a Lego model of it, or a model of it. <laughs> and what I always find interesting about these models is how they never compare with the real thing, whether it's a model of the Union Station in Kansas City, and then they have that in the building, and you can see it doesn't compare to the real building, because it's quite telling that we can't even make a small, one to a thousand scale model, yes, I'm being extreme on that, that doesn't compare with the real structure. What exactly does that tell you? Well, once again, remember it was that magical time at the end of the 19th century, industrial revolution, no safety standards, real wage growth as opposed to phony wage growth. There was also uh, apparently some sort of economic policies that uh, caused trouble in the United States during the Gilded Age. Uh, you might recall there was this big thing called the Depression, and it was just the Great Depression until the actual Great Depression in the 1870s. 
Oddly enough, it of course did not stop this real wage growth, the building of these Gilded Age mansions, and the construction of many state capitals, which we've been over before. So, I don't know. And now we go to Mississippi to take a look at the Longwood House, constructed 1864 in octagonal oriental style. Very interesting, octagonal style. And this is in Mississippi, and we're informed in the official account that the labor that was used to construct this impressive edifice that has a courthouse miniature state capital look to it was done by slaves. The interesting thing about this house or mansion or castle or county courthouse or whatever it was originally intended to be is that the first floor is the only thing that was finished. It's considered a folly of the individual who tried to build it. Interestingly enough, though, this is considered Gilded Age, although we'd say that the construction of it actually precedes the Gilded Age. Construction stopped because of the United States Civil War. Here's one of the original designs of it, and we can see that it has a slightly different type of onion dome, as opposed to the onion dome that was finished. And once again, we look at issues like this where we have drawings and they show different depictions than what we have with the final building. So again, what was really going on there? It's hard to say. And of course, the actual plans that we have that are only single perspective, because in the mighty advancements of the 19th century with the extraordinary human beings that were around at that time, they didn't need multiple perspective plans. You only need a single perspective of plans and you can just make things happen. And remember, no safety standards, and yes, in this particular case, unfortunately, we're told that they use slave labor. Here's an image of the finished dining room, and it doesn't exactly conform to what our expectations would be when we look on the inside of this edifice. So I'm wondering if this was additions that were done later, or what exactly was going on? Did they discover the building, and that's what they did the drawing of, and then they modified it? And they were in the process of modifying it? I don't know. It seems to indicate a different story than at least the official account that we're given. Now, of course, I'm not questioning the official account here. I'm just saying that we see some inconsistencies in the images. Now, that doesn't necessarily prove anything because, as we've said many times, these are just images. But then we see other interior shots or images of this particular edifice, and we can see some of the fine detailed brickwork, and it looks like we're looking up in the cupola here. This is definitely something I would like to take a look at with an on-site exploration, so it looks like I need to add Mississippi to the list. But a very, very impressive bricks, and again, wondering where all the bricks were actually made and formed, and then as you go higher in the structure, you can see more of the woodwork, and yet at the same time, you can get the fine detailing that still stands in what's very clearly different material, more of the stone or masonry or whatever they actually used, whether it was bricks or some form of concrete. I mean, we know they had concrete back then, but... This is a very, rather puzzling edifice to consider because it tells many different stories. A different story on the first floor that's finished and then the subsequent floors that's not. That's what the official account tells us. But I have a very distinct feeling that an on-site exploration would reveal many other interpretations behind this impressive edifice in Mississippi. And then when we look at other images, we can see the fine detailing with the layout of the bricks going into the archway here. And even just considering the amount of effort that would go into that, and then you look at the second uh, archway or doorway in the distance, and you can see that it appears to be some different arrangements of the bricks, and then of course the coloring, as though that was, was an intentional design. And then even here in this particular image, so is this an unfinished structure, or is this a structure that they were in the process of modifying, and they found that it was too difficult? I'm trying to posit some theories for what we're really seeing because the Longwood house or mansion definitely portrays a different picture. And again, we also wonder, why does it look so much like a county courthouse or a miniature state capital almost? And again, we can see that the finished aspect of it doesn't exactly look like what we'd expect. Now, we're told that there is this foray into octagonal and oriental styles because, you know, we've got a name for every architectural style. But what exactly is the Longwood mansion? Hard to say. Well, let's go back to Iowa, the Pierce Mansion, 1893, Romanesque Revival, and this is in Sioux City, Iowa. Another story behind somebody who struck it rich, made it big, hired an architect, and decided to build themselves a little castle, and they did it in Iowa. Now, keep in mind, this is the part of Iowa that's not too far from the Floyd Monument, that wondrous obelisk that we've looked at in other explorations. We also have a unique story that we're also informed that this particular house or mansion or castle was made with a locally sourced material called Sioux Quartzite. So very fascinating. We don't hear of many structures being constructed out of some locally sourced material that is very unique. Granite, quartzite, whatever other cool stone that they had rapid availability towards. 
It's also intriguing to see such a castle like this in Sioux City in Iowa, because one of our mysteries with Iowa is the fact that it's a more rural and agrarian state. It's certainly not known for its vast quantities of natural resources, aside from, of course, corn, which, while it is a beneficial crop to have and helps feed the world, it's not exactly wealth, such as uh, Mr. Flood's silver mine. Now, if we had the story of silver mines, gold mines being all over Iowa, perhaps this would make a little bit more sense. But even if we did, we also have the smaller population that we're given in the historical account. And despite that, despite people being spread out, they were still able to achieve a structure like this. Now, is this really this Sioux quartzite material that was used to construct this? Was this some sort of geopolymer, or was this something else? Well, of course, you know, we should just roll over and accept what we're told by the mainstream account, because why would anybody want to deceive us or tell us something that's not true? Looking at the images, though, you can see that this structure has always been around in Sioux City and that it's had a variety of uses, and you can still go tour and interface with it today, so that's the good news part of the story, is that you can actually see what this Sioux Court site is like in person. I'll admit I haven't been to this structure yet, but it's definitely on the on-site explorations list because it seems to portray many different pictures, and it seems to have a very unique style. We have some columns in the balcony there, and then, oddly enough, we have some subsidiary towers on the second and third floor. Very clearly a three-floor structure and multiple chimneys, and of course that's not strange. They needed to have fireplaces in every room to keep it warm because it gets rather cold in Iowa in the winter. I understand. Taking a closer look, though, we kind of see some of the fine detailing there on this quartzite that reminds us of what we've seen in other structures in Iowa, such as the Anamosa Prison, the State Hospital at Independence, which we're told is made out of Anamosa limestone. Now, we're also told this is not Anamosa limestone, but yet it has a little bit of a similar appearance in how it's actually constructed. But look at the variance that you have, though, with the stones and the pillars and how well milled and formed those pillars really are, or those columns, I should say. And then you also have the two smaller towers that are on either side of the window. So again, very impressive detail. Let's take a look on the inside. And here we can see that the inside portrays a slightly different picture. This is a little bit more of a well-adorned mansion, castle, house. I mean, whatever name we want to go with, manor. So many different names. You know, one of the intriguing things is that Mark Twain, also known as Samuel Clemens, the author from... Hannibal, Missouri, originally, or at least that's what he's associated with. One of the famous things he is known for saying is that uh, if voting actually gave you power, why would they let you do it? Very interesting. Hmm. But, I don't know. Mark Twain also had a lot of uh, different interesting, uh, how shall we say, views and perspectives. And looking at the inside here, we can see the very well-decorated banister. And we can see that there seems to be a higher quality wood. And of course we'll be told it's a higher quality wood. And that's why this house is standing up so well today and why they can still give tours. The other thing that always stands out to me though, and whenever you're in one of these Gilded Age mansions or old world homes, is you get this feeling of relaxation that comes over you. And that's probably one of the reasons why they're so effective when they're converted into bed and breakfast or museums for tours as we see happening here. Well, once again, it's no attention to detail that's spared because even in the window there, you can see that every aspect was considered and having the entire interior of this home feel relaxing and welcoming seems to be the main aim. We'd like to think it's an aim for homes. This is the Turnblad Mansion, 1908, Castle-esque. <laughs> Castle-esque revival style. Yes, I'm making a play because it's called Shadow-esque revival style, but we'll call it Castle-esque revival style. And today, this serves as the American Swedish Institute. And this is in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And, of course, it's a very modest castle. <laughs> Shadow-esque, castle-esque. I mean, the names just really have to crack you up. Now, technically, this is after the Gilded Age. This is early 20th century, but we can still wrap this up in the Gilded Age because the beautiful thing about history is sometimes years have hard and fast beginnings and ends to them, such as the beginning of a conflict. But for a certain architectural style, well, they tend to be a little bit more fluid because there's always somebody who wants to do a revival style and then do a revival to a revival style a few years later. Very impressive castle, though, and not what we'd be expecting to see in Minneapolis. And I wonder where exactly they found the contractors who were so skilled in Minnesota in the 19th century who could suddenly throw up a very impressive castle. Or shadow. Chateau. Shadow. Anyways, when you look and you see the little entryway, and again, you can see that archway with the subsidiary pillars on either side of it, and all the very well-formed windows in the turrets, and then there's a little additional turret. I don't know. I mean, nobody ever questions the Gilded Age as being ostentatious. I mean, you might have reference to it that 
it's intriguing the consideration of how the wealthy were regarded in the 19th century. A lot of people now refer to the wealthy at the end of the 19th and the early 20th century as a lot of wonderful philanthropists who were willing to share their wealth and the results of their wealth with the entire nation. And this is why we remember them fondly. And we compare and contrast that with the term that we have as oligarchs, because there are people who hoard their wealth for themselves. At least that's what the official definition tells us. Isn't this interesting here with that little front porch area with the windowing around it? This is definitely another on-site exploration that needs to be done because I'm questioning what exactly the material was that was used to construct this. And this will be given some usual explanation that it's some form of concrete, and for some reason it's holding up perfectly now, and it's just because they put more time in it, we had more artisans, more craftsmen, no safety standards, so anything could be done in the early 20th century even, all the way up until about oh, World War II. But you can see in other images that gives you the indication that this structure has always been around in Minneapolis. And as I said, this is not something we'd expect to see in Minneapolis, Minnesota, nor in Iowa. And yet, it never ceases to amaze me that we have no shortage of impressive houses, mansions, castles, all over the Midwest of the United States. Here's the individual wags, rags to riches, or wags to riches, if you're a fan of the old cartoons. And apparently he was the one who decided to build this, and I wonder if he had it in his mind that when he was going to find his architect and the contractors and go to all the trouble to build this very impressive edifice in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where the winners are really nice and welcoming, very sarcastic there, that he knew it was going to become the American Swedish Institute. Very impressive. Once again, we have a single perspective drawing because that's all you need for plans to conduct building this house. And the, that just shows you the sheer brilliance of the architects at that time. And that's why I think it's totally acceptable that if you just know who the architect was, there's no reason to ask any more questions. The interior is certainly more lavish on this particular mansion, castle, chateau. And we can see it with uh, some of the figures there that look rather familiar by the banister. Where have we seen that before? I think we can get a better image, though, and see exactly what we're looking at. Ah, yes, of course. The lion with wings. The griffin. And then we've seen that symbol, too, that's above it on the banister in this older image. Now, why is it that this particular symbolism was so popular in the 19th century? Did everybody want to throw griffins on their buildings? Maybe it's a Minnesota thing. You know, we saw it with the Plummer building when we were evaluating Art Deco. Well, we can see that they did use different styles for their other banisters. I mean, you just, just ask yourself the question, why do you need a banister that that's well adorned? Well, because people had money and they wanted these places to look very welcoming and they wanted to show off. And that's what this was all about. It was just about showing off. Yes, this is what we have and we have to keep up with the Joneses in the 19th century style. This is a very impressive image because here you can see all the detail in this Turnblad Chateau or castle, whatever you want to call it. And look at the fireplace on two floors with columns around it. You can also see the detailing in the ceiling because, well, why not? And yet more impressive fireplaces. And I am really shocked that such a structure like this does exist in Minneapolis, even after all these explorations that I've done, because I was certainly unaware of this particular structure until I started doing some referencing for this particular exploration. And this is definitely something that's gone high up on my list of on-site explorations. Again, looking at this main great room, as they would call it, and the way everything seems to intersect here, you can say that this is really a nexus room for this particular Gilded Age mansion. Although, once again, the timeline for construction is a little bit after the technical Gilded Age, but that's all right. Somebody was looking to reference it. And here you can see this with hmm, that uh, figure there. kind of reminds me of that figure that Worf always had in his quarters. You can see it, though, in this uh, particular display with how you have the columns, and this almost has a little bit of a religious connotation to it, or at least something we'd expect to see in the great cathedrals that we looked at. Very fascinating structure. And again, no shortage of well-adorned and very well-decorated fireplaces. And again, there's that particular symbol. And as always, I invite uh, comments for what you think this structure represents. What's the intention behind all this symbolism that we see everywhere we look? And why do you have to decorate a fireplace so much? Well, again, because you've got to show it off. But it's not just the fireplaces, though, in this particular structure. You can see other great detailing there at the top of what looks to be pillars integrated into the walls and just all the fine detailing where it seems to stand out like it's a relief. Again, as though they had all the time in the world and all the resources in the world, and this is no issue. 
And if we need any final confirmation that this is a true old world structure, naturally it's a wedding venue. And just looking at this image, you can see why it's a wedding venue. And I think it's safe to say that all weddings that occur in this particular structure probably have a much better chance of lasting for a lifetime. But that's just my opinion. I'm not a relationship counselor by any means. This is our construction photo. <laughs> yes, they actually say this is a construction photo. So I guess this is what passes for a construction photo. You know, looking through a gate, an iron gate, and then seeing that there's a little bit of a mess on the inside. Yeah, I'm convinced. Maybe you could say that that structure there on the left is actually being built. But what's really going on? The other interesting thing about this particular structure is we seem to have a different variety of rooms on the inside of it. And this is one of the main reasons I want to look on the inside and actually verify that these images really do line up with what the reality is. And if anyone's actually been to this edifice, please let me know in the comments because I haven't had the pleasure yet. But it's very intriguing. Alright, so we're going to close this out by looking at the town of Elberon, New Jersey, or town, township, whatever it really is. So let's this take a look at this Elberon, New Jersey, the of Millionaires. Land of Millionaires. Now, we have a special we're officially site told this is an look unincorporated to really community, see exactly although we know on. how the definition of town, city is rather ambiguous, and I'm sure that's by design as well. It was sometimes called Hollywood of the East, back when it was a summer seashore resort during the Gilded Age, so we can see how it's referenced and associated with the Gilded Age. It's hosted presidents, cabinet officers, actors, industrialists, celebrities, bankers, socialites, and senators, all the wondrous people of our society. These chosen few built fantastic seashore mansions and summered here, making it a playland of millionaires. This distinctive section of Long Branch dates back over 150 years. Fabulous array of architectural and construction work going on at the turn of the century it was a spot of opportunity. The much-heralded NYC architectural firm of McKim, White & White got its real start in Elberon, designing many of the massive seaside houses for the rich and famous. So let's take a look at some of these images that we have of this Elberon. And of course, this isn't a real image, but very fascinating that we can get an idea of how this is all laid out. And once again, I ask that question, if you have that kind of disposable income, why exactly do you want to live in a community? Well, maybe back then, you know, the people who were the elite of society, as they're called, didn't want to be isolated. Ah, Edwin Booth Cottage. Isn't this exactly what you'd think of when someone says cottage? You'd have a large tower on the cottage, okay? This is the wealthy. These are actors. These are celebrities. These are senators. Presidents. Ah, take a look at this. Ocean Avenue. Now again, we don't have a real image here, but this just gives you an idea of how well adorned this is. Look at this over here. An unincorporated community. And of course, the official explanation for why it's an unincorporated community will be because of tax breaks and so forth. Uh, church of the Presidents. And we've got our little plaque out there. Not a very impressive looking church, but there's other things that we're going to look at that are very impressive when we go further into the story of this impressive community. Another cottage. Yes, you can see. This is definitely what we think of when we think of as a cottage. And I seem to recall thinking of cottages as being small, but obviously my impression was completely incorrect. And this isn't a cottage? Oh no, this is an actual house. Okay. And we take a look at this. Now, is this a real image or is this a drawing in an image? Sometimes it's hard to tell. But very impressive structure is a house. And of course, we have a very central cupola. I wonder what that looked like on the inside. And we go down and here's Millionaire's Row. Now look at this. One, two, three, four, five structures that we can see. Very, very well built out with all the trimmings on them. And I don't know what to make of this image at all. You know, if this is an actual photograph or if this is an altered photograph or what's really going on. I'm not suggesting that this proves anything, but the fact that we have an account of this community and we do have some images. What do we have here? Lewis B. Brown, 1813 to 1900, main developer of the city's Elberon section. Mr. Brown looks like he lived a very stressful life. I mean, look at those eyes. I don't know, he must have been under a lot of demands of all these millionaires who were telling him to pull all this off. You need to have the perfect development for this community. If it's wrong, you're gonna be fired. Of course, we're told there were much greater consequences in the 19th century, but you know, we have many different uh, perceptions of the 19th century, so who, who's to say what was really going on? Now let's scroll down here. We're going to look at some of the other impressive structures because then they try to fill this up. Oh, look at this. President U.S. Grant's Cottage, 1870. Very modest cottage for Ulysses S. Grant. Of course, we're told that the former president uh, ended his times in hardship because he didn't exactly have the greatest business acumen. And as a result, he was swindled and lost his fortune. 
He managed to get the fortune back for his family when he wrote his memoirs. And it's good to hear that President was able to recover his fortune, even though it wasn't recovered until after he passed away. So again, we have many modest structures, but as we continue looking, we'll see some more impressive ones, such as this Italian villa, again on Ocean Avenue. Yes, look at this. All the trimmings you would expect to see <laughs> with the many arches and the entryway. And yes, of course, this is exactly what you'd need. So moving on from this impressive Italian villa, let's see what else we have. Another summer home. Yeah, it's a very modest summer home here. I can understand why this would be considered a summer home. Very intriguing. Oh, look at this. Myron H. Oppenheim home called Castle Wall. Yeah, you can see why they call it a castle. Looks like you actually have a castle wall that's on the property. I wonder what's exactly going on there with that. Let's see what other impressive structures we have. Ah, House of Many Gables, early 1900s. The Elberon House was massive. Yes, that sentence has a massive talent for understatement. Just impressive. Also called the Towers. House was torn down in 1940. Of course, all these houses were probably torn down because, you know, they were a little excessive. Aladdin's Castle, 1920s. Mary Guggenheim summered here. Mm, looks like Mary Guggenheim had herself quite a lot of real estate to enjoy summer activities. Very beautiful. Aladdin's Castle, 1930s. It was at the foot of Park Avenue. And just look at the detail you have in this. You have a tiered dome almost here, and then you have a more well-adorned dome that looks like it's over a balcony. One, two, three, four floors. Did it have a basement too? It'd be very interesting to see interior shots of this. We might have to explore this. The Diller House, somewhere in Monmouth County. Here it's the Diller House. So it looks like it had many different names to it. Interesting, the same structure with many different names. And of course, this is the most telling image that we have. Now again, is this made out of wood? Is this made out of stone? Is this something else? It's hard to tell just from the image itself. We'll of course be told that perhaps this was a little bit more of a modest one that was only made of wood except for the chimney there, but who knows for sure. So what are your thoughts on this uh, unincorporated community with its very lavish structures? Let me know in the comments. And what did you think of this Gilded Age exploration? Well, thank you for joining me. Welcome to the Restituta Orbis channel, and for our Halloween special, we're going to be taking a look at eerie houses. And as you no doubt know, if you're a frequent viewer of this channel, you probably guess that we're not just going to be looking at normal eerie houses. We're going to be taking a look at old world houses. We're not necessarily going to be exploring the concept of Halloween, or All Saints Eve, or All Hallows Eve, or all the many different connotations with Halloween. I think it's safe to conclude that there is something significant about this series of days that run in what we track as October and November. We consider how it directs our perceptions towards some of these old houses and the asylums. They always have a reputation of being haunted, of inducing fear. In other words, they're to deter us from actually going and exploring them and understanding them. And we have to ask the ever so pertinent question, why? Why would someone not want us to explore these wondrous edifices? Or why is there such a controlled perception concerning the edifices that we're going to take a look at? Most of the buildings we'll be taking a look at are actually designated as homes, although there's certainly a questionable aspect in terms of are they homes, are they manors, or did they again have some other function? Because, as usual, when we go back to the Great Houses exploration that we did, we consider that there's a lot of perceptions that try to keep us from exploring these older buildings. We're supposed to have understandings that they are haunted, or haunted in a way that they came from a different time frame. We think of all the connotations that we have with Halloween, or All Hallows Eve, or all the other different names that we have for this particular day. 
And what purpose does it really serve? The purpose seems to be to induce a little bit of fear, and we like to be afraid. We like to think of ghosts and specters and shades and spirits, and we like to have that little bit of fear that goes into us when we think about these things. And yet, are these just ghosts? Or are these some sort of trans-dimensional beings that have a strange connotation with them? We don't know, and we're not going to consider that in this particular exploration. But it does show us that there are many different controls that are imposed on our perceptions that want to deter us from exploring these unique locations. We have so many aspects with Halloween that induces fear within us. We also think of the reputation that we have with the asylums that all rose in the 19th century. Many of those perceptions carry over to the houses and the great homes and the one building that we're going to explore today. You look at these impressive edifices and you see castle structures that appear to be gothic, and you also think of the reputation that's associated with them. The very reputation that seems to be reflected from Halloween. You think of going in and exploring these buildings on your own, and you feel that natural sense of fear and uncertainty that always accompanies you whenever you enter them, walking through them, exploring them, trying to gain an understanding for what they were originally like and what they were about. And if your perception is already colored by fear, and if you're thinking about shades, spirits, inspectors, and ghosts, you're not necessarily going to be focused on what the true story of the building is. You don't really know much about Halloween. You thought no further than the strange custom of having your children wear masks and go out begging for candy. Festival of Samhain. The last great one took place 3,000 years ago when the hills ran red with the blood of animals and children. I always thought that Conal Cochran was a much more terrifying villain than a guy with a mask and a bunch of knives who's easily outsmarted by his lifelong victim. Well, let's talk about Linwood Hall, 1897 to 1900, one of our wondrous gilded-aged mansions. And unfortunately, this once great residence has deteriorated due to a state of non-use since around the 1940s. We have our usual 19th century story of our rags-to-riches, powerful business magnate, Peter Widener, who started his business by selling mutton during the United States Civil War. And then somehow he rose and got involved in traction and trains and investments to include even the Titanic. They say this is built out of limestone from Indiana, but as you can see on this map, there's plenty of limestone deposits all around Pennsylvania, which this mansion is located north of Philadelphia. This mansion was designed by Horace Trumbauer, pictured here, another brainchild of his. He also designed the Philadelphia Museum of Art, famous from the Rocky movies. And as you can see, a single perspective drawing is more than enough to build a mansion. Let's look at this very carefully, though. So if we're to believe that this is all Indiana limestone, again, I'm not wondering what the true construction material is, because why bring in limestone from Indiana when you could just grab limestone from Pennsylvania? Well, like I said, if something's not worth doing that's nearly logistically impossible, then it's just not worth doing at all. We see the usual construction techniques of columns and many different pillars, and yet in the interior we see how well it's laid out. Funny that they would go through the trouble of having a tiger skin there on the floor, but you can see it in the walls and the ceilings and just how well decorated it all is. The ballroom with its exceptional ornate detail that we'll just be told is merely the signs of the Gilded Age, that everyone lived in such extravagance. And of course, it's also the usual story of they needed many rooms to connect or collect their art. Because just having a simple gallery or building it somewhere else, it's just not worth doing. It needs to be as part of your residence. And that's one of the primary stories that goes along with this. Isn't it funny how we constantly hear these repeating stories, and it seems like there's so many people from the 19th century who were rags to riches, almost as though they were living the true American dream, or the true American dream was possible in the 19th century. Of course, we have all of our explanations and regulations and why it's not so possible now, although it is for some choice people. This is a very impressive building on the inside, though, but let me ask you, is this really what you would think someone would want to lay out their house to be? that their family was going to reside in for the rest of their known history. And that was originally the plan behind this house by Mr. Widener, was that this was to house his family for many generations to come. And you can see that it's been in a state of deterioration. 
and that it has worn down because for some inexplicable reason, despite the fact that this remarkable edifice that anybody could use, and it's been owned by different interests since the 1940s when the last member of the Widener family could no longer maintain it. And this is actually the ballroom that's been renovated a little bit. There's this movement that they're going to renovate this mansion now, finally, after about seven decades of it just sitting around. Here's the pool room. Isn't it interesting how we always have an incredible pool room? And it's an indoor pool room, too. I'm thinking of all the other indoor pools and atoriums that we've seen in other explorations. But for 70 years to just allow this edifice to sit around is baffling. And of course, it has the connotation with it that it may be haunted, there may be other aspects to it, that you don't necessarily want to explore it or ask the real questions. But the main question that comes to my mind that we have to ask about the Linwood estate, or the Linwood house, <laughs> funny that they call it a house, is why did nobody use this? Ah yes, here we have our wondrous statues that also adorn the property because these very, very wealthy people who were also very altruistic were all about collecting art at the time. Oh, and they were also bibliophiles too, so they collected books and art. Funny how that story repeats itself. Even with all the deterioration and decades of neglect, you can still see the beauty within this structure. You can also gain an appreciation for just how well it's built. Well, of course, it's Indiana limestone. It'll last forever. At least that's what some people settle with. But the original question I had is, why was this just allowed to sit around, neglected for decades? Why didn't some other main interest, perhaps a political party, perhaps some other sort of movement that had financial resources not purchase this wonderful edifice and put it to use doing something else. I mean, you have all this room to store art. <laughs> you also have a ballroom that you can have major dances and assemblies in, or you could even do whatever purpose that you purchased the building for. And don't tell me that these special interests lack the money. Because you can see, it's almost as though it was intentional that this wonderful house, mansion, manor, capital building, as it looks like, no, it's not a capital building, Oh, I think it looks nicer than the White House. It's interesting that they say this is the finest example of a gilded mansion, and yet this was built after the Biltmore, which of course we're told is the greatest house in the United States. William Randolph Hearst might beg to differ with Hearst Castle, but he didn't put up any kind of fight to hold on to Hearst Castle after he put decades into building it. And Julia Morgan was nowhere to be found. Look at the interior of this, though. We've seen all these construction cues before, and where have we seen them? We've seen them in what we call administrative buildings, whether it's city halls or, more importantly, state capitals. Ah, there's our familiar checkerboard pattern or chessboard pattern to the floor. You know, in case you want to play a life-size game of chess or checkers. And then we have all those little orbs there above the arches yet again. Very well decorated main entryway, but why exactly would anybody want something like this for a house? I can understand a gallery like this making sense for a state capital. Well, no, I really can't, but you know, at least that's where we've seen it and that's what we associate it with. But why would somebody want their house laid out like this? You could just see Peter Widener. Listen, dear, listen, kids, we're going to live in a building that looks just like a state capital, and you're going to like it and our descendants are going to live in it for the next, oh, a thousand years, because remember, it's always a thousand years. Look at some of these blocks, though. Now, is this really all Indiana limestone, or is this some other form of concrete? Something, again, above Rosendale concrete, and not the cheap Portland cement. We know darn well if this was Portland cement, this thing would be cracking and falling apart, and it never would have lasted past 1960, let alone 2020. I'm very impressed, though, once again, by the fact that just a random architect and then a random construction crew is able to erect all of this. And, of course, it'll simply be hand-waved away by saying he was a rich, powerful business magnet, he had the right investments, well, except, of course, for the Titanic, and he knew the right architect who just happened to design other buildings that used what they'll call neoclassical architecture. Although, then they'll always substitute names. Kitchen isn't holding up too well, but, you know, the kitchen was just there to prepare food and have logistics. You can see some of the photos from its glory days, and it doesn't really look all that different even after decades of deterioration. Nice fountain, too. And then looking at other perspectives of this house, this manor, I'm still baffled by the question as to why somebody else didn't acquire this property. To use it for whatever, and it could have so many different uses. Heck, they could have converted it into an art museum, converted it into some sort of tourist attraction. 
I always enjoy these pediment depictions here because they don't really seem to have anything to do with what the building was intended for. And what exactly is that symbol there that's around that window? And then we also have the orbs here on this side of the stairway. Very intriguing. And I really wish that we could get some construction photos that detailed a little bit more on how they established the columns and the pillars. Well, there's a picture of Peter Widener himself, and I'm sure he thought that mutton was going to be the ticket to financial success. And as with all the other great business magnets in the 19th century, he was in the right place at the right time. Here's a son and grandson, and they were not so fortunate because they happened to get themselves tickets on the Titanic because the family were big financial supporters of the White Star Line, along with numerous other financial inst institutions. And yes, you're well familiar with the story of the Titanic, and James Cameron made sure that everybody in the current generation remembers the story of the Titanic. It went down, and we have the news that many innocent people died and perished horribly, to include John Jacob Astor, but don't worry, Mrs. Astor was safe. You know, that's always important to remember. You know, Mrs. Astor being safe was very important. In fact, Mrs. Astor survived a subsequent murder at a socialite's house, according to the animated TV series The Simpsons. Now, I'd like to tell you that Mrs. Astor went on to do wondrous things and that she opposed the centralization of financial institutions in the United States, but that's not the case. She did marry subsequently twice afterwards, and when she passed away in the 1940s, she did have her own mansion. So I guess if you're comparing and contrasting how she died compared to Nikola Tesla, she got a much higher finishing score in life. You know, she couldn't take the mansion or the wealth with her, but that's okay. So a very unique and interesting building that still exists to this day that stood up after decades of neglect. Now we move on to the Castle of Donna Chica, built in 1915, although the exact construction timeline is uncertain. This is made out of granite, or so we're told, and this is in a more isolated portion of northern Portugal. This isn't right next door to Lisbon. But quite intriguing that it appears to be either a castle or has many church construction cues to it. And of course we have the typical story of the very wealthy individual who has nothing better to do with their monetary resources and decides to hire an architect who's actually from Switzerland to design what basically looks like a church. Now we're told that this incredible edifice, despite being opened in 1915, was not finished on the inside, although the interior photos seem to give us a different explanation. And truly looking at this, much as the first building we looked at looked at looked like it was an administrative building or capital, this looks like it could be a church. A church that was somehow repurposed to a house instead, because you see some of it with the windows and the arches and the columns, and we've seen these construction stylings before. And again, I posit the question, is this all granite or is this something else? Definitely something I'd like to explore on the ground because we see the very large rounded towers and yet we have a more classic square tower and what seems to be a combination of different materials. I mean, I guess I could see some of the granite in it, but, and I mean, these look more like granite walls, but it seems as though this is a bit of an amalgamation. And the legend goes that this particular building is haunted as well because they ran out of money when they were trying to build it. The interior was unfinished, although the picture seemed to give us a different impression. And this is a very isolated building in a rural area of Portugal, designed by a Swiss architect who came into Portugal. Very interesting renderings though and very interesting images that we have of the fireplace and of course it's one of our very well adorned fireplaces with lots of decorations on it made out of columns and beautiful artwork all around it. Now what exactly is that material that's around it? And again we have another story of this being a long term abandoned edifice and here you can see the interior here and yes it looks very unfinished. Yes, of course, it's deteriorated because it's been sitting around for decades, but what do you think would happen if we had a modern McMansion-type house or a house from the 21st century that was just allowed to sit around for decades? Do you think it would hold up this well? Neither do I. But here's what I'm talking about where I say this little bit of rendering maybe gives it the impression that it could have been repurposed as a church. Now, some of the interior photos aren't exactly the best quality, but they still paint out the picture that you have something that was indeed finished on the inside. So what exactly was going on here with this structure? And here we have our complex stairway. Now it looks as though the stairs are made out of some kind of concrete, but due to the fact that they're holding up well, I'm not inclined to think that it's Portland cement. Of course, I'm sure we'll be told, yes, it's Portland cement, just like this fireplace, it's Portland cement. Look at some of the artistic decorations above the doorways beneath the arches. And again, you see the sign of more advanced construction techniques and architectural prowess. There's also a wide array of different kinds of rooms within this particular structure. 
And yet, they throw in a little bit of a column here in what appears to be either a bathroom or a green room, not sure. And some of the other interiors where we just decided to throw columns up because, again, this is somebody who seems to have infinite financial resources. Well, except for when they didn't, and you have to wonder if the real account behind it is that they just didn't have the financial resources to complete restoring and cleaning it. Look at the ceiling here. And you can see a little bit of, of a sign of wooden construction there, and we will be looking at a wooden structure. Let's go to the Mayfield House in Ireland, built in 1740 with 1800s upgrades. So yes, now we head over to Ireland, and again another bit of an isolated rural area. Although the story we have with this one is that the family that decided to found this particular house or mansion also founded the nearby town in Ireland. And you can see it has many of the same construction cues that we saw in the previous two structures, 1740. Although they have a nice little explanation that it was expanded and rebuilt in the 19th century. Well, of course it was. And here's actually a photo of that from supposedly the 1830s, although I question that because this is a really good photo for the 1830s. Hmm. Like the tower there, and yet the main building itself. And this is not actually a photo of the interior, but this is an idea of what the inside of these incredible edifices in Ireland looked like in the 19th century to give you an idea of what it may have looked like in its glory. Unfortunately, this building, which was used as a tannery in the 20th century for a period of time, as tanneries were quite big in Ireland, or so we're told, it deteriorated. And of course, it was left neglected for a long period of time. And like these other structures that we've looked at, they're looking at renovating it and restoring it to its great glory. And here we have another wondrous fireplace. And yet, I can't help but wonder what did this building look like on the inside during its glory days? Because why is it these structures are just allowed to sit and rot for decades or longer in some cases? That's the real question that we just let go of. I mean, we're told that we live in these nations in the Western world or the so-called Western world where you have numerous entrepreneurs, where you have people who are rags to riches stories, especially in the 19th century. And yet at the same time, we're to believe that in other situations, they allowed these houses to sit around. Well, we didn't have as many entrepreneurs in the 20th century, you see. Things were changing. There was the Cold War. There was the rise of brutalist architecture. Nobody wanted these wonderful edifices. They had no use for them. They were just buildings that were left to sit there and rot. Because that made sense. I understand. Why would anybody want to acquire a building that's very structurally sound and stood up for decades or longer of neglect? And unfortunately, this is what this wonderful Mayfield house or manor or castle or whatever you want to call it in Ireland is deteriorated to. Yet you can see in the exterior signs of construction of more advanced architecture and construction processes. And what's this made out of? Well, we know it can't be Portland cement because if we go off the official account, Portland cement wasn't invented yet. So what exactly is this made out of that's standing up so well? And it looks to be brick construction in some places. Although this is definitely another on-site exploration that's added to the list because I would certainly like to verify it. Now we do have one interior photo, although I couldn't verify if this is actually from the location, but we're told it is. Yeah, imagine if that was a flat screen TV over there. I know it's a picture, but you know, I wonder how they'd explain that. Well, people worked harder in the 19th century and there were some people who were able to invent a flat screen TV. Nikola Tesla came over there, he invented it, but then the technology was lost for various reasons. He didn't patent it and he died broke. Look at the fence right here. Very impressive, and is that some sort of cast iron or is it a different kind of construction material? And we can see that the patio that it's laid out on, I mean, it's just a real tragedy that this structure is just allowed to sit there and deteriorate as it has. We can see that it's holding up very well, and again, was it really built in 1740 or was it built much sooner? Is it a lot older than we think, or is it not nearly as old as we think? It's really hard to tell because, as we question a lot, it's difficult to know exactly what year has passed. Well, it's down on an official account. It's well documented. Yes, all you have to do is write something down and then it becomes reality. It becomes an even more reality when more people read it, more people believe it, and more people repeat it. Hmm. Kind of sounds like that John Carpenter movie in the mouth of madness. No, that couldn't possibly be what he was alluding to. Once again, yet another beautiful sight in the lovely what we call Nation of Ireland, although it's had many other names through its history. Let's go on to the Rockwell House when we go to Georgia in 1838, in a town we've looked at before, Milledgeville, which was the original capital of Georgia. Built by a gentleman named Colonel Rockwell, not to be confused with that odious character from the awful Iron Man sequel, this is a wood-constructed house, or so we're told, yet it has some columns that are 
holding up quite well. Think of this, if this is all made of wood and this structure is still standing and this has been renovated, this is coming up on 200 years old, about 185 years right now. The columns seem to be holding up quite nice, and you'll find a lot of unique structures like this. Now there's an urban legend that good old Colonel Rockwell, when he finished building that fence that you're looking at right there, it cost so much that he had a heart attack. Well, it still seems to be the original fence, and what exactly is that made out of? Some sort of cast iron or some other material that we just can't identify, although if we have a machine that will tell us what material it really is. It's impressive though that the wood construction of this house has held up for this long. And this is something that I like with old world homes, and if you could find one of those bed and breakfasts and you'll think, well, it's just made out of wood, it's not made out of brick or concrete or limestone or sandstone or any of the other forms of granite that we have, it's just made out of wood. But it alludes to the concept that the quality of wood was much better in the past. And once again, we have our explanations for it. Well, the trees were better in the past. And there's a lot of pictures that we have of forested areas that were deforested that are supposedly from the 19th century. And we'll be told that those trees were of much higher quality, the wood was of much higher quality. But again, it reflects to the concept of logistics and harvesting, and yet it was so much better. Lumbering was so much better in the 19th century that they could build a house in 1838 out of wood that's still standing to this day. Oh, and not only is it still standing, but they opted to completely renovate it. So, I don't know. It, it comes down to asking those kinds of questions because why do we not build like this? And of course, everyone will just go with the explanations because we live in a disposable society. And if we live in a disposable society, it's so much more beneficial. I'm still impressed by how well, again, another structure held up after years and years of neglect. And even if it is wood, you can see some of the impressive carvings on the wood. And we also have to remember that in some of the state capitol buildings, such as our building number one in the Iowa State Capitol, they do have a lot of fine woodwork. And the only thing that's really deteriorated in this building over time is some of the brickwork in the fireplace and then some of the painting. But it looks as though the woodwork in the entryway and the floors and the walls held up quite well. It's very impressive. And even the columns themselves were told were made out of wood. Now the front columns, they tell us, are replaced with concrete down at the bottom. And yes, Milledgeville is on tab for an on-site exploration, especially as we covered it in our Atlanta exploration because of how it applied as the earlier capital of Georgia. Here's what it looks like after the renovations. And once again, a house that was built in 1838 that, in my humble opinion, seems to exceed just about any modern house that we have now. You also know that this thing is going to stand up to whatever comes its way. And isn't it impressive that they managed to completely renovate what had been the original structure of this house? So don't let the fact that it's made out of wood deter you. And I have the feeling that if you stayed in this house, once again, you would find that it still remains well ventilated and there are aspects about it that seem to exceed what you could buy for two, three, four times as much to this day. And if you want to experience that, then one of the best ways I can suggest is find yourself a good bed and breakfast, especially somewhere in the Midwest, or really in locations all across the United States, where you can find a house like this, that's still this well preserved, this well renovated, and you have this sign of luxury. 1838 in Georgia, of course. Because wood back then was just that much better, and it held up so much longer because it was superior wood. We can't get wood like that now though, so don't have any dreams of building something like this from scratch. In fact, don't have any concepts of building any of these houses we've looked at in this exploration from scratch. They just can't do it, or they tell you it's some unbelievable price, something beyond a billion or a hundred billion dollars. You know, we can do other things with a hundred billion dollars now, and we won't talk anything more about that. I'm impressed by how well renovated the fireplace though is on the sitting room and then even the decorations that you can see in the wood on the main entryway. There's just so much space. All right, well now we're going to take a look at the Steric Building, a 1928 Gothic Revival in Memphis, Tennessee. And I thought it would only be fitting that we include one building that we would normally think of as Art Deco. Well, this was a Gothic Revival in Memphis, Tennessee. And it's still one of the most stunning buildings in Memphis, Tennessee to this day. And like these houses, has a long history of neglect. But look at some of the artistic detail that they put in the walls and between each of the windows. How easy was that to do? Well, apparently it was very easy to do in the 1920s. We could do anything in the 1920s. We could throw up buildings left and right. It was the great building boom. Yet we don't build buildings like this now. And we'll be told that the reason we don't do it is because it's wasteful. Yes, of course. 
And again, what exactly are the walls of this made out of? Yes, they'll tell us what it's made out of, whether it's some form of concrete or granite or sandstone or limestone, etc., etc., etc. But you always get the impression that when you have this kind of decorative detail and what may be some sort of modular construction concept, that this is a building that far exceeds anything that we have now. And indeed, you can see how it still stands out on the Memphis skyline to this day. I like that little building down there in front of it, too, with the little uh, round tower on the corner. Those are always so fascinating to me. But looking at different perspectives of this building, you can see that really it exceeds many that we have in modern buildings because there's an artistic appeal to it. They put some effort, whoever actually built it, and yes, we have our official account, and we have our account about how an architect did it, and how the construction techniques were worked together to produce a building that for some reason nobody bothers to make today. Well, because it's just not financially or economically viable. Look at the entryway there. Now that seems like a different kind of concrete than what we'd expect. And remember, this isn't even 100 years old yet, but it's declared on the historical register. Nothing suspicious about that. Here's a closer look at some of the fine symbols that we have between every single window on this impressive building in Memphis. And even some of the doorways here. You can see something more advanced here. Yeah, no cheap card reader here. Here you actually have what's either brass or some other material that's on each of the doorways with a classic keyhole. We do have a construction photo of this building, and yes, I guess you can call it a construction photo. Snow in Memphis, which I guess does happen here and there. And you know, we have the skeleton structure, which doesn't really match up to some of the rooms and interiors that we see. But the other interesting thing on this photo is you can see there's a border on the side, but on the top, for some inexplicable reason, you can't really see the border. Not sure why that is. You know, maybe it's just, you know, the top of the photo deteriorated because they left it in the sun for years. You know, it was just a coincidence, and it just took time to do that. But again, it begs the question, what was really going on here with this building? And why is it so difficult to have an actual pictorial representation of this particular building? The Steric Building. You would think that there would be a series of photographs documenting this. And, well, we do have publications, so I guess it's well documented. Because, again, all you need are words on paper and suddenly things become reality. It's that simple. Mm. And I just included this individual. This was an attorney who resided in the building for a long period of time. But uh, he kind of reminded me of the warden from the film Shawshank Redemption. Not exactly sure why that is. And it's just an interesting photo. Here's the grand opening of the Steric Building. And isn't this fascinating that uh, they have the doors and look at the ground there. It looks like it's a little bit older. Well, maybe that was just from construction. Here's a photo of the interior. These are all the elevator operators. I guess things were very different in the early 1930s. Look at some of the walls, though, and the detail there. It just doesn't really match up with what we saw from the other construction photos. But you'll see some other exploration photos because, once again, this is a building that's been abandoned for a long time for various reasons that don't really make a lot of sense, so don't ask questions. And you can see that there's other parts of the building that they've laid out as the more traditional office building. I'm thinking of all these other old world buildings they've done this to across the land, probably one of the biggest examples being in San Francisco, of how we had a pre-San Francisco earthquake building that was modified to a <laughs> modern building. But on the outside of this building, you can get the ideas of the previous construction techniques. And Granted, it's not 100 years old yet, but that's if we accept what we're told for the timeline. I suspect this building is much older than what we're told. Could be wrong, but we have many inclinations that it was a building that has been around for a very long time and was modified to suit the needs of whatever was going on at that time. Yes, it's well documented with a really poor photograph. Yes, it's well documented with a little bit of publication there and some advertisement. But here, you know, you get the impression of granite here, and I'm not sure. I'd like to explore it in person. And once again, what kind of concrete there, and how long has that really been there? Or is it some other superior concrete mix? And then you can see here in this interior of the National Bank how they've converted it into a bank. And yet at the same time, we know that there's many banks, especially across small town United States and other locations, that have that internal layout despite having an incredible exterior. Look at some of the details here, though, within the building. Here it has what looks to be mermaids and various symbols. Once again, that impressive orb symbol. And the main entryway to the elevator bank. And this definitely gives us the concept of the Art Deco building. But we're very much assured this is not Art Deco. This is Gothic Revival. Indeed. 
Now here it looks like you get the impression of bricks on this part of the building. So I'm not really sure, was there addition, was there renovation? Who knows exactly what the actual account is. If we take everything at face value, then of course it makes perfect sense. But then again, everything makes perfect sense if you don't ask any questions. Just as long as it's written down and just as long as you repeat it, it becomes more real. Just like that book in the Mouth of Madness. Well, actually that was the title of the book in the film, In the Mouth of Madness. But once again, you can see why this building would have that reputation of this being a frightening building to go explore. It's been abandoned for a long period of time. And of course, you would ignore all the wonderful architectural cues that still survive so well. Isn't it intriguing, though, how certain parts of the building seem to have held up much better than other parts? And of course, we'll have the usual explanations. Well, parts were renovated, other parts weren't renovated. Yes, indeed. And yet, I'm questioning the fact that it seems... Welcome, and thank you for joining me for today's exploration of Hearst Castle, a remote old world manor. Looking at the overall estate, we see that this is something that defies simple explanation. We have an isolated, opulent manor. They don't even bother with any pretense on this particular structure. They just out and out call it a castle. And it's not too difficult to see why they call it a castle. What's the real story, though, behind this remarkable edifice? in the isolated central coastal region of California. Well over a three hour drive currently with modern roads, although to be honest, it takes much longer than that. That's just straight line distance if you're really cruising between Hearst Castle in Los Angeles and San Francisco. And imagine how long it would have taken to drive there back in 1919. And we'll talk about that. And it's not just the main edifice itself. There are several subsidiary structures on the estate that gives it a appearance of opulence and something that defies simple explanation, especially given the story that we have with its construction. And yet, Hearst Castle does have a little bit more of a, how shall we say, well thought out story. It makes sense. There could be some reality or some truth to the story of construction of this estate. Or is it simply something that's a little more well thought out? with a little more detail put into this. Is this a building that was built by our contemporary civilization? The efforts of a newspaper mogul and a brilliant genius architect? Or is this simply a story that was told for our entertainment, our amusement, and also to gain our understanding and acceptance of why this remarkable edifice continues to exist today in the middle of the central coastal region of California? not located near any major city or any area where it would actually make sense. And yet there it sits. Let's get an idea of where Hearst Castle is located exactly in the central California coast, as we're told. So here's the overall estate, and we'll go to map view. Hearst Castle is relatively isolated. It's about three miles from San Simeon. Typically you go to the little visitor center right here, and then they'll take you on a nice little bus up this very, very windy road, and that's how you get to the castle proper. However, when you zoom out, you see that San Simeon and the castle itself is a good 245 miles from Los Angeles, and about 240 miles from San Francisco. So it's safe to say that you're very isolated out there in San Simeon. There's really nothing close by. That's the situation now. And imagine the situation in 1919 when construction began. Very, very isolated. California is a big place. How does an amazing castle end up on this plot of land in the middle of, well, a very isolated area? Earth's castle was formerly known as La Cuesta Encantada, Spanish for the Enchanted Hill. Isn't it interesting? We always have this enchanted, well-known-of hill in an isolated rural area. Reminds me of Holy Hill in Wisconsin. The only difference is there they say it was Jesuits or somebody in the distant past who discovered it. Interestingly enough, if they actually had the remnants of a Spanish mission of some sort on this hill, perhaps this story would make a little sense. Let's get into the story of Hearst Castle. 
And we see the incredible layout for Hearst Castle. We have Casa Grande with 38 bedrooms, Casa del Monte with 4 bedrooms, Casa del Mar with 8 bedrooms, and Casa del Sol with 8 bedrooms. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Neptune Pool, what a name, 345,000 gallons, and the Roman Indoor Pool with 205,000 gallons. Yes, with all those bedrooms, kind of gives you the impression that this isn't a house or a residence, but that this is some sort of resort or sanctuary, potentially. If this was a building from another civilization, what use could it have had? Well, given its relative isolation, we can speculate that perhaps this was some sort of sanctuary, especially if we had a reset that was very tumultuous. Regardless, we're going to look at the official story that this was a residence, an estate that was built all to fuel the ego of this individual, William Randolph Hearst. Born in 1863, an individual who would rise through the success of his family, the Hearst family, to inherit a media empire, and that's what he'd run throughout the 20th century. In 1919, he inherited a great deal of money and land that his family had gone camping on when he grew up, and he decided that he was going to build his incredible, amazing, enchanted palace on this plot of land, this hill that we talked about. He couldn't do this alone. He needed a great, incredible genius architect, and he hired the services of Julia Morgan, 47-year-old, one of the pioneering women architects in the United States. Brilliant and a genius herself. She had 700, billion, 700 buildings to her credit, and this would be her most encompassing and well-known project. We'll talk about some of the exploits of Julia Morgan, and yet Julia Morgan had a very interesting personality. She was stated to be a recluse and had some introverted tendencies, yet somehow she formed the perfect team with William Randolph Hearst. Quite an interesting story and quite an interesting combination of personalities. It's here, though, we have to consider the fact that uh, they started building this property in 1919, and we're told that the Hearst family moved in in 1925, so only six years. Now, we do have accounts that some of the structures were brand new, and they try to go to great lengths to convince us that that's the fact. We're also told that uh, Julia Morgan was so brilliant that since this was very isolated, and the official account does talk about how difficult it was just for her to get there from her San Francisco office, how far she had to travel, and also the difficulty in recruiting and retaining a labor force. I guess all those traveling laborers weren't around in the 1920s anymore. Perhaps they'd all found jobs. In any event, uh, Julia Morgan, who, quite frankly, you must classify as a genius, regardless of whether you go with the official account that she had architected this house and overcome all these obstacles, or if she just played a role very, very well. I don't know, and I'm merely suggesting that there could be an alternative explanation, especially when you look at the opulence, the beauty, and the detail that goes into this incredible structure. So the Casa Grande, or Hearst Castle itself, one of the exploits of Julia Morgan is that she managed to sort out the difficulty in bringing water to the site. The nearest water was seven miles away, and she had apparently designed a gravity-driven reservoir, all by herself, and we don't exactly know who built it, it's not stated, to provide water, because they needed water for the labor force, and they also needed water to make this incredible concrete that they used. In any event, when you look at the structure, you see its ornate detail, and of course we'll be told this is Spanish colonial revival, although we have other architectural styles that go into this. So, not only was Julia Morgan uh, very brilliantly well trained, and we're told that she was, we also find out that she managed to create an amalgamation of various architectural styles in Hearst Castle, which is why at the start I posed the term amalgamation revival style. But look at the detail around the door and the walls. It is definitely something incredible to behold. And we also have to consider the challenges of building this. Now, they try to obfuscate this a little bit by saying they started building this in 1919. And William Randolph Hearst and Julia Morgan worked on this for 28 years, until 1947. And then finally, with his financial fortunes changing, they couldn't continue to construct it. Yet, we're also told that the Hearst family moved in in 1925. Look at the beauty on this tower, though. And while you could say this is Spanish colonial revival style, or whatever style you want to call it, you also get the hint that there's some other kind of style in it. I don't know, what do you think in the comments? How does the detail and the decoration on these towers incite you to feel? And 
to be honest, it is in a beautiful area on a beautiful hill. And well, where would we be without wondrous, beautiful fountains to provide great water with steps and handrails and beautiful light posts? Yes, yeah, so all this on this isolated property out in the middle of a remote area in central coastal California. Not exactly what you'd expect to see. And probably not something that's easy to explain if someone were to just simply come across this structure. However, we're going with the mainstream narrative that this was all the work of William Randolph Hearst and Julia Morgan and the various labor forces that they had out there and the various contractors that she worked with. There's even stories that they had built their own hydroelectric plant to provide power until they were put on city power a couple years into their residence there. Ah, yes, Neptune Pool. Very beautiful and gorgeous, and here's where we have our Roman Greco revival style. And, yes, you know, the Piedmont, or the triangular formation that we often see with the beautiful columns. You just can't help but be overwhelmed by the sheer beauty and the striking visual depiction that you have, even in the image. Now, I was at Hearst Castle about ten years ago, and I remember how beautiful it was, and considering the fact that, well, it's over a hundred years old now, and it was approaching a hundred years old when I was there, I was amazed at how pristine that it looked. And yet, there were signs that some of these structures were much older. And of course, you have all these beautiful, ornate statues. And then, of course, you look and, and again, we see these statues that are fine carved. So, difficult in bringing all these logistics and all these workers out here. And yet, they managed to achieve this. And of course, it's somewhat hidden in the historical narrative that it took them so long. But then, conversely, we're told the family moved out there right away. Now, how long do you think it would take modern contractors with an architect, although I don't know if we could find an architect that would match the genius intellect level of Julia Morgan, to really pull something like this off now? And I'm sure there's those of you out there that'll believe, yes, we could do this. We just need to throw enough money and enough effort at it, and we can pretty much do anything. But I really wonder... There's also something else interesting when you consider the Neptune pool here, and you see the architecture and the layout from a different perspective. We have to consider the fact that this was built in 1919 through 1947, although let's be honest, we have a lot of inclinations that it was already built, and this is a scene from the movie Spartacus with Crassus, the main antagonist, played by Sir Laurence Olivier. Isn't it intriguing that in 1960, they decided to film a film on location at Hearst Castle, which doubled for Crassus's Roman villa. And you can see why it would be quite convincing. And if you go back and you watch the movie, yes, this was filmed at Hearst Castle. Now let's take a look at the interior. Yes. I'm sure they were still working on the fine carving and detail of that ceiling even after the family moved in in 1925. Now, this is part of the library that you're looking at here. And it's always more of a story when you look on the inside of a building and you see these incredible details. And, you know, I could just see uh, Julia Morgan there personally supervising the work crews as they carved all of that in, in the ceiling. And who knows, maybe uh, William Randolph Hearst was down there below reading a book and he was getting a little annoyed as little pieces of wood shavings and splinters hit him as he was reading his book. But again, this is just something that you have to question. I mean, even 28 years to put all this detail in this structure. And when you go and you tour the Hearst Castle, or manor, or palace, or whatever you want to call it, you're constantly overwhelmed by the sheer amount of detail that you see in every room. And keep in mind, this is still standing. It's still there near San Simeon, California. And you can go visit it. And you can tour it, and you can see the beauty and the opulence in every single room. And I was starting to get different eyes when I went here the first time. But I still recall thinking it just wasn't easily explained. It didn't make any sense. How much effort would it have really taken to achieve all of this? And of course, we're given the explanation that William Randolph Hearst was a person who was very 
profligate. He was someone who would spend vast amounts of money, and there was even a film made about him called Citizen Kane, and they considered it a satire in 1941. Yes, a satire. Oh, here we are, another sitting room with the amazing, beautiful, well-decorated fireplace. And, again, another very detailed and ornate ceiling, and as you can see, no detail spared. And look at the beautiful floor, too. As though they had nothing but infinite time, infinite resources, and infinite resolve on their hands. Or again, we just attribute it to the genius of Julia Morgan. There was just nothing she couldn't pull off. They say this was uh, William Randolph Hearst's bedroom. Isn't this a contrast, this individual with this very extreme personality to indulge in such opulence and expenditures. And, you know, if you look up the word profligacy in the dictionary, supposedly you'll see his picture because they associate him as a profligate. Regardless, this was his modest bedroom, although you see the ceiling and the window dressings and the detail. It's not very modest. And, of course, his uh, billiards and pool room. Yes, I would love to have a billiards and pool room like this. And where would it be without our incredible fireplace with what looks to be the big angel on it? And, of course, we have detail in the ceiling here as well. And look even at the doorway and the detail over the doorway. And remember, we're very isolated here. Isolated in remote California, and yet you can put in a fireplace like this with this kind of detail on it back in 1919 and 1930. Or maybe they'll say this one took a little longer. They're still working on that fireplace. Uh, well, and you know, the, other, the other part of the story is during World War II, they stopped working on the castle because supposedly they were in danger from a possible Japanese invasion. At least that's what they said. And here's that ceiling, and, and just look at the detail there. This is just the billiards and pool room. That's all this is. And you can see it in the light fixtures and everything else. And, of course, all the tiles, and there's even accounts of how Julia Morgan worked with various contractors to get the right tiles and everything else. I mean, it's really incredible. And here's another one of the remarkable sitting rooms, although maybe I would just go ahead and upgrade this to Extraordinary or Beyond Description. Look at the detail in the ceiling here. And you thought you saw detail in other ceilings that we've looked at. And yet here we have fine carving, shaping, however they did this. And yet incredible works of art. Now we're told that William Randolph Hearst was a very astutious art collector. And then we go to uh, another one of the very beautiful sitting rooms, or whatever you want to call it, grand halls. You could have any number of names for this. And here, of course, we have another fireplace. We have great detail in the floor. And you also see up in the walls there, it's as though they just couldn't stuff enough detail into this. And look at the fireplace. The detail in the shape of the fireplace, and then you know what you'll be told are carvings or whatever else. How exactly did they do that? It's a good question. And as you start to see the interior of this incredible castle, how do you think this was all done? This is definitely a story we have to question, even though it seems as though they put a little bit more thought into it. And yet everywhere you look, anywhere you go in Hearst Castle, you see more and more of this. And it gets more complicated and more ornate as you continue to progress within the castle. The layout of it's also somewhat difficult to describe as well. And about the best way you can see it is to actually go on the tour. And you find yourself almost as though you're lost within the structure. Now, you're not really lost, but you just sort of have that feeling. There's almost something ethereal about being within the structure, as though it gives you a completely different feeling. Perhaps it's just my perception, because it's hard to explain all these incredible sights that you see and all this immense beauty, loaded within every room, in every single detail, on the walls, the ceilings, the floor, and here the dining room. Yeah, say... Very modest dining room, as you can see. You know, you can imagine all the scenes from many different movies that they could film and use this dining room for. Although, maybe they couldn't explain it because the other interesting thing to me is the unique mixture of styles or the amalgamation you see of styles here. But here you go, another fireplace and the doorways with the beautiful detail on them. 
And remember, this is very isolated. We can't let that simple fact escape us. Was this simple genius and resolve and just hard work for years and William Randolph Hearst's infinite resources, which did eventually dry up. He did run into financial problems in the Great Depression, as many others did, and didn't do so well when he decided to supposedly take a stand against uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Here we go with more ceiling detail. It's just very, very difficult to easily describe. And yet, just looking inside a few of these rooms, you have to wonder how much detail and work would have gone into this. And now we go into the indoor Roman pool. And here we see another example of incredible beauty that defies simple explanation. How much effort actually went into creating this pool? And how easy was it for the workers or the contractors at that time to execute and carry this out? Look at some of the arches and the pillars and the support structure of this pool. To say nothing of its innate beauty with these lights and the reflections, this definitely gives you the feeling of being in some sort of science fiction fantasy land, and perhaps this location more so than any other. And now we look at some of our supposed construction photos of the outdoor pool, or the Neptune pool. Very convincing right here, isn't it? And you'll find the construction photos are rather lacking for Hearst Castle. So I don't know, perhaps uh, William Randolph Hearst didn't want it that well documented, or maybe there were other things going on. Giving him the benefit of the doubt, and we're going with the mainstream account here on how the house or castle was actually built. Strange photos, and here are the Casa Grande, and this is a very strange one. There's something that looks very off about this photo. And I don't want to bias your opinions, but it's just hard not to say it, especially when you look and you see the previous photos of the Casa Grande, or the main structure of Hearst Castle, and you look at this photo, and you see something that just doesn't seem to match up. And of course, when you go on site and you really look at Hearst Castle, and you're able to interact with it, you see its reality. And here's William Randolph Hearst himself with uh, some of the leading financiers at the time, late 1920s, early 1930s. Strangely enough, when uh, William Randolph Hearst ran into financial problems, it seemed like no one was there to cover for him or to help him out. He was therefore unable to continue his vanity project at Hearst Castle in 1947 and had to relocate to, well, I would presume, less presumptuous quarters for himself. He'd had a lot of family problems, and the actual person who helped him facilitate hosting at Hearst Castle was Marion Davies, his mistress. And we go back to the movie Citizen Kane, which was made about William Randolph Hearst by the aforementioned Orson Welles, who has appeared on this channel before in War of the Worlds because of his radio broadcast. This came out in 1941 and was considered a satirical picture on William Randolph Hearst. An official account tells us that he tried to suppress this film. Interestingly enough, there is an analog to Hearst Castle called Xanadu in the film. And they even say the very stones of many another palace. And this is a satire. You have to wonder if Orson Welles was being on the nose or if he's throwing us a hint, saying that Hearst Castle was really from something else. It was another palace, and he simply claimed it. And there's Orson Welles, and you know, many people consider Citizen Kane the finest movie ever made. It's a very interesting movie, and I certainly recommend if you get the chance to watch it. I wonder if they're ever going to make a bio of Orson Welles, because if they do, I think they could get actor Jonathan Frakes, also known as Commander William Riker, to play Orson Welles, as in his later years he bears a very striking resemblance to Orson Welles. And I have to admit, in the original days of watching Star Trek The Next Generation, I never thought that I'd see the day where Commander Riker resembled Orson Welles. Let's take a quick look at the Hearst Building in San Francisco as it still stands there today and see what it looks like. Oh, good old San Francisco. It's been a while since I've been there. I think the last time I was on the ground was in 2006. And there it is, the Hearst Building. Let's uh, drop the man and take a look. Mm, lots of old world buildings in San Francisco. Don't worry, we'll be getting to an exploration of this. Ah, yes, and here is the Hearst Building. And let's look at the front facade that Julia Morgan worked her magic on. Very beautiful, very pretty. 
And the building's been there a long time. Wait a minute. What's this over here? Why does this building look familiar? Uh-huh. I've seen this building somewhere before. But where? Ah, yes, now I remember. From the San Francisco earthquake in 1906. This is the Call Building, completed in 1898 in San Francisco. And this is what it originally looked like, and we see a very beautiful building with all of the architectural prowess and construction prowess that we had in 1898. Now, will you see a building like this built today? No, you will not. But you can see what happens when a building like this supposedly survives the San Francisco fire, and then it is transformed into the very beautiful and ornate central tower that it is now, insert sarcasm. How can you do that to a building? What a bunch of, shall we move on? In any event, I can't stand to really look at this building. It's just a tragedy what happened to it. But we'll be getting to an exploration of San Francisco and we'll discuss it. In closing about the Hearst Castle, what do you think? Do you believe that this is an amazing vanity project of William Randolph Hearst that was facilitated and carried out by the architectural and just simple plain genius of Julia Morgan? Or was this a structure that was from a previous civilization? Was this some sort of refuge or resort or a building with some other purpose let me know in the comments what you think it is that managed to survive and they simply had to contrive this story because william randolph hearst in addition to being a media mogul was also a politician he was elected twice to the house of representatives as a democrat and ran unsuccessfully for governor of new york and for president of the united states what do you think about this story how do you think this stacks up with what we're told or was it just something that was contrived to give us an explanation and to explain the presence of this building? Well, as always, ask questions, explore yourself, and you'll restore the world. Thank you for joining me today. Please like, comment, and subscribe.